Please remain standing now for these words as we read together Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We are at the end of a four-week series that we've called Refocus. Uh, this has been a series that we've talked about refocusing our minds around uh, Christ and the kingdom message. And as we've been refocusing, we've been reading through the book of Philippians. It's, uh, it's a short book. It's only four chapters long. If you haven't already, I would encourage you to go ahead and read it. Uh, it'd take you one sitting just to, to go ahead and, and read through this powerful letter that Paul writes to the church in Philippi around 51 AD. Uh, when we began, we talked about seeing differently, putting on the lens of Christ, uh, and, and seeing the world through those lenses. Uh, the next day we talked about uh, what if, and we've learned about um, how to bless others uh, last week as Pastor Mark shared with us, and this week we're talking about peace. And we're talking about peace. We read these words from Paul, to worry not. Worry not. When we hear these words about losing our anxiety, when we hear these words about worrying not, we realize that there are some things that we just can't do on our own. Right? That regardless of however many skills that we may have, there still remain some things that we just can't do on our own. And regardless of however many skills we have, it seems like the jobs that we have just kind of take longer. Have you ever gotten involved in like a home repair, even if you're a handy person? If you've gotten involved in a home repair and you thought, oh, this will take a week and it takes a month, right? Or you got involved, you thought it was going to take a mo- month and, and it takes a year. Uh, you, you've had that happen, right? It seems like regardless of however many skills we have, there are some things we just can't do. Uh, I would like to say that I'm a skilled person, uh, but I'm not handy at all. Uh, one of the skills that I, um, that I found that I had in junior high was actually uh, to juggle. Um, this is really kind of a pointless skill, right? I mean, this doesn't fix my sink. Um, if it did, I would be the most handy person ever, right? But this is pointless, right? We have many skills in our lives, uh, but there are some things that we just can't do. What if I just juggled through the rest of the sermon? Would that distract anybody else? Um, There are some things we just can't do, right? Worrying not is one of those things. It seems like worry is the stem of a lot of our problems, right? Worrying is the stem of a lot of our problems. That that worrying can lead to anger. It it can lead to addiction. It, it, It can lead to a lot of suffering in our lives that it bleeds out into other areas. That this is what happens when we let worry fester into our lives. But if we truly hand it over to God, if we trust God with those things that he calls us to trust him with, if we do that, then we can truly lose that anxiety, we can truly lose that fear, we can lose that worry. Because there is something in all of our lives that only God can do. There is something in all of our lives that only God can do. What is that in your life? What is that thing in your life that only God can do? Will you let him do it? It's hard, right? It's hard to hand over that thing to God. Because many times we think, if I just hold on to it long enough, I can solve it, right? I, if I just hold on to it long enough, I can, I can figure this out and I can do it on my own. We, we've done this before, right? We know that this is how many of us live. But God says, no, if you give it to me, I can help. And in fact, I'm the only one who can do it. Uh, as many of you know, I have a two-year-old daughter uh, named Anna, and um, since I'm preaching, I'll show you a picture of her, uh, because I have a lot of cute pictures of my daughter. This is her eating ice cream on the back porch, Um, and and, and I love my daughter, but she's two years old, and if you've had a two-year-old, you know how, like, wildly we can do these different emotions, right? Like, one day can can be, like, the happiest she's ever been, and and, and the angriest she's ever been, like, all at once, right? We know how this works. These, this is a two-year-old life, and and one of the things Anna has started doing is just getting really independent, right? She started those independent streaks where she wants to do everything on her own, but there are some things she just can't do, right? And, and, and so I'll watch her as, as she's trying to open, right, her, her sippy cup. And I, and I just watch and know that this is headed for disaster. And I just say, no, Anna, if you just hand it to me, I can help you with it. I can, I can take care of that. And, and she says, no, right? And she runs away with it and she opens it and orange juice just goes like all over our, our bedroom and, and it's all over there. And then she's all upset because orange juice, whenever I said, if you would have gave it to me in the first place, 
If you would have gave it to me in the first place, I could have helped. God calls us to trust him with that thing that only God can do. Will you let him, friends? Will you let him? This is what Paul writes both to the church in Philippi and to us as well. Uh, he, he begins with these words uh, that we read just a little while earlier. It says, do not worry about anything. Do not worry about anything. Now, if you just said this to your friend, they would probably think you were crazy, right? You, you just can't do this. And, and you're right. You just can't do it alone. You just can't do it alone. In fact, we need God's help. We need God's help to not worry. When Paul writes these letters, many scholars think that he borrowed from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount when he writes these words to the church in Philippi that he actually borrowed from Jesus' own sermon. We heard these words in the Gospel of Matthew from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your span of life? Now these words are impactful to us, right? They're impactful for us in, in Edmond and Deer Creek, people who worry about different things, right? We, we, we worry about all of these things in our lives, but Jesus was speaking these words not to Edmonites in the first place. He was speaking to those who are in poverty. Those people who, who weren't even allowed to gather into the synagogues and the temples. Those people who, who were so poor and so unclean that they were cast to the outside of the community and forced to hear preaching in the outdoors on the side of a hill that Jesus was speaking to people who were hungry. Jesus was speaking to people who didn't know where their next meal was going to come from or who, where they were going to sleep that night. They didn't have clothes to spare. These are the people whom Jesus was speaking to. And he says these words, to not worry. To not worry. I think it's interesting that Jesus says these words of not worrying directly after he talks about this. In chapter 6, verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters. For a slave will either hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and what, friends? Wealth. You cannot serve God and wealth. That I find it so interesting that Jesus saw a direct correlation between anxiety and wealth. Right? Jesus knew that our fears and our worries and our anxieties and all these things that we get wrapped up in would be directly tied into where we spend our money and to what we do with our power and our authority. Jesus knew this, and he speaks these words. Paul borrows from that letter and, and speaks to the church in Philippi and says, Do not worry about anything. Do not worry about anything. Now, again, these are words that we can't just take directly and go do on our own, but we actually have to live into them, right? We, we have to keep saying this to ourselves over and over again so that it'll actually have an impact on our life that we might actually live into it. This is countercultural to, to our world today. This is countercultural to our world today because normally our culture would operate, when you, when you tell somebody something and, and, and they don't at first believe it, how do they respond but in this way? I'll believe it when I see it. Right? You've heard this. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah, you, you've told somebody something and, and they don't believe it. Why? Because they haven't seen with their eyes. They haven't touched it. They haven't, they haven't experienced it. They say, I'll believe it when I see it. But we as Christians are called to take these words, this do not worry, and we're called to respond in this way. I'll believe it until I see it. I'll believe it until I see it. That I will live it out. I will speak it in my life each and every morning that I will remember these words that Christ speaks to me, that I will live it out, and then because I live it out, I will see it. I will see it in this world. This is how Scripture is to affect us, friends, that if we let it soak into our lives, th these are not just one-hit fixes, that this is something that we live out day in and day out, that if we do that continually, friends, then it will actually change something inside of us. We might have the power to actually hand over that thing that only God can do. But first, we must live into it. There's a man by the name of Horatio Spafford who lived in the 1800s in Chicago. Uh, Horatio was a wealthy realtor. He actually owned many properties in Chicago, and he made a great business uh, as a realtor in Chicago. 
But then as some of you may know, the Chicago fire broke out in 1871, and it burned most of his properties that he owned. He almost became poor, and he didn't have enough money to support his wife and his four daughters. And so what he decided at this time was that it was time for them to move back to Europe. It was time to move back to Europe, so he made arrangements, and and he scheduled for a ship to take them uh, back home into Europe. And uh, just before the ship was to leave, he got detained. He had to come back and solve some matters before he could head off with his family. And so he sent his wife and his four daughters ahead across the Atlantic to Europe. As his wife and his daughter traveled across the ocean, they were actually collided with another ship. And in hurrying to get off the ship, the daughters drowned. The wife was the only one managed to be saved on the ship. She was able to be rescued and she was taken to Europe the rest of the way. And when she arrived, she sent a telegram back home to Chicago with two words. Saved alone. Horatio received the word saved alone in a telegram back in Chicago. Immediately he knew what had happened, that his four daughters had all died in the journey. So he made arrangements for himself to travel across the Atlantic to Europe, and he got on a ship, and he started the journey, and about halfway there the captain came to his cabin And he informed them that this was the spot that your daughters drowned. Horatio decided at this point on this ship in that cabin to write a hymn, to write songs of praise to God. He writes these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. I imagine that Horatio had trouble experiencing these words. That as he wrote the words, it is well with my soul on that cabin in that ship across the ocean. As he wrote those words, at first he didn't know them. He didn't feel them. But as he continued to pray, as he continued to sing praises to God, they soon changed his life. That he learned to experience God in a profoundly different and greater way than he ever had before. Horatio met his wife back in Europe, and they continued to be missionaries throughout Europe and Jerusalem for the rest of their lives. That they would tell the story of a good God who loves his children. This is what it means to live into words, friends, to let them soak into your life that they might actually change you from the inside out, that this is what the power of the gospel has to do. So what is that thing in your life that only God can do? Where is it found deep inside you, that thing that only God can do? What is it? And will you let him do it? Paul continues to write to the church in Philippi, and he says, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. In everything, friends, in everything. Because here's the truth. God wants to be your everything in all things. God wants to be your everything in all things all things. It's the truth that God doesn't want you just in the good times. God doesn't want you just in the good times to sing his praises, to say, thank you, God, this is so awesome. God doesn't want you just in the bad times, just when you're upset with him, just when things aren't going your way. God wants you in all things to be your everything, to be your everything, that you might be entirely soaked in the spirit of God. This is what the Lord wants for his children, that we might let God be our everything in all things, friends. In all things. This is what Paul writes to the church in Philippi. And he says, by prayer and supplication, 
Supplication is just a word to say, just ask for God what you need. Ask for God what you need in your life. Because here's the truth. God wants to give it to you. God wants to give you good things, and God wants to give you what you need. Jesus will say later on in in the Gospel of Matthew, he says, ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who searches, finds. For everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for bread, will give a stone? Or if the child asks for a fish, will give a snake? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? How much more? Because you give good things to your children and you love it. It makes you feel good. My daughter loves ice cream. I wish I loved anything as much as she loved ice cream, right? Don't you just wish that? Sometimes I wish I loved anything as much as Anna loves ice cream. I give her ice cream and she just goes nuts. She loves it. And that gives me so much joy in my life right? To give her ice cream is just, I get excited whenever I get ready. Like even before I say something, I'm like, Anna, you want ice cream? And it just makes me so happy, right? We went, we went to Frozen on Ice, friends. A 27-year-old man went to Frozen on Ice and had the time of his life. Have you done this? I just got to watch her enjoy this whole thing. Just watch her eyes light up whenever all the, when Olaf comes out, she just lost it. It was so much fun, It was fun for me. How much more then does God want to give us good things? How much more, friends, does God want to give us good things? So ask, friends. Ask for what you need. Now, now here's the truth. This could be easily construed as just ask for everything right? Ask for a car, God will give you a car. Ask for a pool, God will give you a pool. Ask for, you know, a a mansion, God will give you a mansion. But what we're called to ask for is what we need, friends, what we need. We we read about this in the book of Exodus. We read about the Hebrews being liberated uh, from Egypt, from the hands of Pharaoh. And when they get liberated, they're driven out into the wilderness where they are called to go to a land that God will show them. And while they're out in the wilderness, they get hungry, right? And they tell Moses, say, Moses, we're hungry. And Moses prays to God and says, God, they're hungry. And God sends manna. God sends manna. Now, now manna is a Hebrew word just kind of meaning, I don't know, right? It, it comes from the Hebrew meaning what? And, and it just really means uh, it's, it's mysterious. It's, it's weird. I don't know what it is. But God gives them this manna, this bread that they can eat. But he has clear instructions about this bread that he sends to the Hebrews. Uh, God tells Moses, gather as much of it as each of you needs. An omer, a a measurement to a person according to the number of persons, all providing for those in their own tents. The Israelites did so, some gathering more, some less. But when the Israelites measured it with an omer, those who gathered much had nothing over, and those who gathered little had no shortage. They gathered as much of it as each of them needed. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over until morning. But they didn't listen to Moses. Some left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and became foul. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it as much as each needed. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. So basically, here's what happened. That that when the Israelites were out in the wilderness and they wanted food, God gave it to them. But there was clear instructions that they were only called to gather enough for one day. Enough for one day. Don't take any more and don't store it up, but take enough for one day. And those who did store some up, that, that food became foul. It bred worms so that they could only take enough for one day. God said, take enough for one day and I will give you more tomorrow. Take only what you need tomorrow and I will provide the next day. That was something that only God could do. For the Israelites. That was something that only God could do for his people. What is your manna, friends? What is your manna? And will you trust God with it? Will you let him? Paul continues to write, and he says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul writes about the peace of God, and 
something we don't understand in, in today's world is that when Paul writes about the peace of God, that was in direct opposition to what was called the peace of Rome or the Pax Romana. Uh, the Pax Romana was actually a time period in Rome between 27 BC and 180 AD. And this time period in Rome was the time in which Rome experienced the greatest prosperity, the greatest growth that they had ever seen in the world, that Rome was a superpower in this time. And, and, and they grew to a population of 71 million people. 71 million people in, in between 27 BC and 180 AD. That this was Rome, it, it was the world's superpower. It was said that the sun never set on the Roman Empire because it was so vast, it was so large. I would remind you that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi in 51 AD, in the middle of this Pax Romana, in the middle of, of this Roman prosperity. Paul writes about the peace of God, which would surpass all understanding that would guard your hearts and your minds that would guard your hearts and your minds. When Paul talks about guarding, the church in Philippi would say, we don't need something to guard our hearts and our minds. We've got physical guards, right, to guard our physical bodies. We, we've got that covered, Paul. We've got that down. But what they didn't know is that 180 AD, Marcus Aurelius' son, Commodus, would become emperor. And he would struggle to defend the expanding Roman borders against small tribes and villagers. That this super bear that had grown so big, that it got so big that they couldn't maintain it, friends. And that they would see the fall of Rome. Something that they never thought could happen. And at that point, they would realize the need for someone to guard their hearts and their minds. Paul would be reminded of these words from Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. He says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. We would be reminded that fear in the Bible is not fear as we understand it. It's not to be afraid of or to stay away from it. It's just proper honor and, and respect. Right? That, that Christ is calling for this honor and respect of him who has the power over our minds and our, and our souls, friends. That we're not called to fear Rome. We're called to honor and respect him. And by honor and respecting, we are called to give over that thing that only God can do in our lives. I don't know what that is for you. But I pray and I hope that you would consider that, that you would hold that dear and that you might even hand it over to Christ. Trust God, for he is good, friends. He is good. A woman by the name of Dr. Alice McKenzie is a professor at Perkins School of Theology. Uh, she read these words from Paul, this uh, Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, and, and she chose to rewrite this passage to help make it more applicable to our lives today. So my hope and my prayer is that you would pray on that thing that only God can do in your life, and that you would hear these words from Dr. McKenzie, and that you might find that they would soak into your soul, that you might live these words out. Let us hear these words from Alice McKenzie. She says, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding is guarding your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus right now. Whether you feel it at this moment at an emotional level or not, this is the truth. So get in the habit of constant prayer. prayer. So get in the habit of, of constant prayer. And you, you will come more and more into contact with this gift of peace. Do not beat yourself up that you have anxious thoughts. This is the common human tendency. Do not suppose that you can banish anxiety through self-mastery and be indifferent to ups and downs of life. Only the peace of God in Jesus Christ can master your anxieties. Only the peace of God can master your anxieties.